Yeah, so... And we're live. We're live, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so this is a teaching, which I was just saying a bit about an activity we do in Platypus. It's one that is often done in Platypus chapters. It's called Capital in History. Um, and basically it's um, laying out the foundation of the kind of perspective that gives the basis for the Platypus reading group and the approach to history and the approach to the left. Um, it's an attempt to think about a, what hist- the meaning of history for any Marxist left, what history meant for Marx and Marxism. Um, and in Platypus, you know, our like, founding slogan is the left is dead, long live the left. Um, so we uh, have a left-centric view of history. Right? We take the, you know, we could say um, that one's account of history is one's account of the present. So we're interested in what people's account of history is because uh, it's a left and failure of Marxism. Um, and the various ways that has played out over the 20th century. So in Platypus, we talk about the death of the left through the old left in the 30s, 20s and 30s, the new left in the 60s and 70s, and the what we call the post-political left in the 80s and 90s, up to today. Although those kinds of categorizations won't be the uh, subject of this talk, um, this is kind of the basis on which we understand Marxism and subsequently... Um, that failure. But what else, the other thing that comes out of that, that um, death of the left is the concept of regression. Um, this is something that's explicit in the works of uh, Walter Benjamin and Theodore Donner. Hi, Richard. Okay, so, uh, sorry. Um, this concept of regression that's explicit in Benjamin and Adorno, but really they are getting from Luxembourg um, and Lenin and Marx, and that's something else that we'll um, get to. But Understanding the theory of regression, which is central to Platypus, is really based on the theory of history that I'm going to try and lay out in this teaching. Um, so, well, I'll, I'll start just by saying, seeing as we're in Oxford, that um, one of the texts that was important for Platypus at the beginning, uh, back in 2006, 2007, which they read then, um, is an essay by GM um, Tamas, Gaspar Tamas, Hungarian. Marxist called Telling the Truth About Class and um, it's a very interesting essay and he does start by talking about this uh, relationship between history and class um, understanding what class is from a Marxist perspective, what his- is related to what history is from a Marxist perspective this is obviously something he's getting from his uh, fellow Hungarian George Lukács Georg Lukács um, whose book and essay famously titled History and Class Consciousness, um, that and being like a dialectical relationship. So it's not history on one side and class consciousness on the other, but class consciousness as history and history as class consciousness. Um, and Thomas starts by taking, um, as his kind of object of critique, E.P. Thompson, seeing as we're in Oxford, we can talk about the Oxford Marxists, the new communist historian group in the 1950s in England, people like uh, Hobsbawm, Christopher Hill, E.P. Thompson. Um, And E.P. Thompson has this massive book, The Making of the English Working Class. Um, And uh, Thomas makes this distinction between Rousseauian socialism and Marxian socialism. Um, which maybe I'll get a bit more into later, it's important to say it's not Rousseau, but Rousseauian. Um, And it's to do with how one understands class and history. And so he says that really E.P. Thompson's um, theory of the working class is not Marxist, actually anti-Marxist, and that it's actually anti-theory. So we can think about what theory is as well in relation to this. Um, And a kind of a brief way of laying out what the diff- what the distinction is, is that in Thompson, the working class is actually a positive principle. Right? It has characteristics and traits which form an alternative principle to, say, the bourgeoisie or the capitalist class. And that realising socialism would somehow be realising these aspects of the working class. Um, so it's interesting to note, for example, that... If, I'm, if I remember correctly, Thompson's 
huge book actually ends with the Napoleonic Wars. Um, whereas from, from a Marxist perspective, it's in, you know, if you read Engels, um, The Condition of the Working Class in England, the issue of the English working class, you know, as the proletariat really begins in the 1820s in Turkey, uh, particularly with uh, Chartism in the 1830s. So one distinction there is between a kind of um, a sociological understanding of class and a political understanding of class. The class becomes something when it's politically determined. Uh, so there's an issue of subjectivity in class. Um, so um, opposed to this kind of Thompson's view is um, what Thomas calls the Marxist perspective, which is, uh, he uses words like the demonic aspect of the working class, the negative aspects of the working class, the idea that the proletariat just has to abolish itself, not realise itself, but abolish itself. Um, this is coming from Marx, obviously, with the use of the German word Aufhebung, um, meaning simultaneously to preserve and overcome and transform. Um, and this kind of uh, dialectic in which the, the proletariat's task is to abolish itself, that it stands for the dissolution of bourgeois society, um, is uh, the Marxist perspective that will be based on the kind of theory of history that I'll outline in this teaching. One thing to note about what, how this opposition plays out in the 20th century is that the, let's call it the E.P. Thompson version of class and history, leads to a kind of reactionary anti-capitalism. So capitalism becomes this bad thing against which a kind of, one has a sort of Nietzschean resentment, um, and you, one becomes against things like the market, and instead says, well, we're for use value against exchange value, or something like this. Um, and these are kind of, uh, just laying it out in a basic way like this, many of the traps that the left in the 20th century has fallen into um, in abandoning the dialectic. Right? This is what Luxembourg accused Bernstein of, being undialectical. Um, and uh, we can kind of come back to that at the end to see how that plays out in the left today or across the 20th century. Um, so... Um, Yeah, there's an important quote there with respect to the. Um, sorry, I've got like various books with me, and like, like just reading from notes. Um, but I think um, an important quote with respect to that is from Marx, from the introduction to the contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, um, where he says quite clearly, um, when the proletariat announces the dissolution of the existing social order, it only declares the secret of its own existence for it is the effective dissolution of this order. When the proletariat demands the negation of private property, it only lays down as a principle for society what society has already made a principle for the proletariat. Um, and then later, philosophy can only be realised by the abolition of the proletariat, and the proletariat can only be abolished by the realisation of philosophy. Um, so Marx, in already in fairly early writings, is talking about this kind of um, self dissolution of the working class um, and that was actually something that was um, kind of visible the working class as a negative principle, as the dissolution of bourgeois society um, is something that uh, was visible to conservative critics in England in the 1830s, so Thomas Carlyle is the great example um, in his 1839 book Chartism um, he kind of grasps this through kind of jokingly talking about the uh, way in which utilitarianism is responding to the crisis of the industrial working class, mass unemployment in England, um, by saying that basically the English public is very upset about having to pay taxes to maintain local parsons, you know, uh, church figures, but they'd be very happy to pay for local exterminators. And that instead of having public, um, uh, certain public facilities, they'd be happy to pay to have a public pool of arsenic in which women could come and throw their babies. 
Um, so there's this issue of the working class, you know, uh, emerging in its own like dissolution, seeming as the dissolution of bourgeois society. And conservatives at the time can't really understand, or even liberals particularly, can't really understand this. They're trying to work it out. And one of the things that they, one of the ways they try and grasp it, something Engels mentions in um, Conditions of the Working Class in England, is what they call the Irishism of the English working class. The Irishism of the English working class. Meaning when um, you start having riots, uh, even with um, people smashing up machines, um, and you start having people killing their babies, uh, this kind of thing, th this realisation of the crisis of society, that the proletariat stands for the crisis of society, people are like, well, I thought these were like bourgeois subjects, individuals, and now they're acting like barbarians. Is this, are they just like Irish? Right, this is like the, the racism of the, of the mid-19th century, I guess, but, or the anti-Irishism, but it does really point blank pose this question of what bourgeois society is, and is it the case that these are people who have not been bourgeoisified already, or that there's some it's some new problem, some self contradiction of bourgeois society? So that's the kind of problem that we're going to get into, and uh, so we need to talk about what bourgeois society is and what that means. Um, but first, I'm going to begin by reading a passage from Marx. Um, and this is kind of the basis of um, this talk, in a way. Um, so this is a passage from the Grundrisse, Marx's later discovered notebooks before he wrote Capital. Um, and before we read it, we can put on the chart our first set of terms, which we'll talk about. So being and becoming. Um, okay, so we can think about that while we read it. So, Marx writes, The ancient conception, in which man always appears in however narrowly national, religious, or political a definition, as the aim of production, seems very much more exalted than the modern world, in which production is the aim of man, and wealth the aim of production. In fact, however, when the narrow bourgeois form has been peeled away, what is wealth, if not the universality of needs, capacities, enjoyments, productive powers, etc., of individuals produced in universal exchange? What if not the full development of human control over the forces of nature, those of his own nature as well as those of so-called nature? What if not the absolute elaboration of his creative dispositions without any preconditions other than antecedent historical evolution, which make the totality of this evolution, i.e. the evolution of all human powers as such, unmeasured by any previously established yardstick, an end in itself. What is this, if not a situation where man does not reproduce in any determined form, but produces his totality? Where he does not seek to remain something formed by the past, but is in the absolute movement of becoming. In bourgeois political economy and the epoch of production to which it corresponds, this complete elabor elaboration of what lies within man appears as the total alienation and the destruction of all fixed one-sided purposes as the sacrifice of the end in itself to a wholly external compulsion. Hence, in one way, the childlike world of the ancients appears to be superior. And this is so, insofar as we seek for closed shape, form, and established limitation. The ancients provide a narrow satisfaction, whereas the modern world leaves us unsatisfied, or where it appears to be satisfied with itself is vulgar and mean. Okay, so being and becoming, the ancient and the modern. Um, this kind of starts to give us our first set of terms. So being, we have um, another set of terms, what is versus what ought to be or uh, could or should be. Um, we can also think about this in Hegelian terms, nature and spirit, right? Um, and we can see how in the ancient world one is born into what is and reproduces what is. Um, communities are established by supposedly natural bonds. Um, whereas when Marx is talking about the modern world, the absolute movement of becoming, man producing himself, 
um, beyond uh, any previously established yardstick, a kind of infinite uh, perfectibility. That freedom is a kind of tool that um, taking up from bourgeois society. Um, and we'll be thinking about these as we kind of go through the history. Um, but I, one other thing to say there is that what's clear in the Marx quotation is that um, this, what happens in society, in bourgeois society that we'll get into, is that this, this becoming, this production of man by man, uh, this infinite perfectibility and change, uh, obviously produces history in a new way. Change then happens in history, man produces himself in history. And the task of freedom then becomes a historical problem. One could say, as Peter Proust does, um, that uh, man became historical. The man discovered his own uh, historicity in a way. Um, okay, so let's move on to the second, um, second chart. So to think about um, this problem of uh, history and freedom and humanity, one can, we'll talk about it in the broadest possible set of terms. So we can go all the way back to um, this 10,000 BC point where we have what's called the Neolithic or agricultural revolution. So people go from being hunter-gatherers um, to uh, being peasants, basically. Um, so, for example, in the in the biblical narrative, right, the civilization is um, the mass of peasants in the fertile crescent um, in the Middle East and North Africa, um, and then you, we get what's called what we can call traditional civilization. Um, and here we have like hunter-gatherers, then we have peasants, and you have basically um, a caste system, right? Humanity is ordered into castes. You have a priestly caste, a uh, um, monarchic class, and peasants. Um, and by the time of the French Revolution, this is what would be called like the three estates. So we have the um, priests, the kings, and the and the third estate, uh, which is something that we'll um, come on to again. Um, and then what happens, kind of beginning in the 1400s, or however you want to date it, is we have another change that, uh, on the same order, or even more, which we'll lay great emphasis on, to um, what we're calling bourgeois society. or we can say modernity, right? And this break here is one that we want to like lay great emphasis on. Um, so, whereas here we have a caste system, uh, here we have bourgeois society. What's like bourgeois? Urban workers, right? It's a society of those who labor. Um, so, for example, in the Abbé Sayer's uh, famous pamphlet in the French Revolution, what is the third estate? Uh, the third estate is those who labour. Uh, it's everyone who isn't a priest or part of the aristocracy. And the Abbé Sayer's writes, what is the third estate? Everything. What is it? No, it has nothing, and it's going to become something. Um, so the revolution in which the first two estates are cast off, society is those who labour, right? The third estate becomes the nation, the people, um, society as such. Um, and really this is like a new uh, phenomenon, that society has never existed in this way before. Society mediated by social relations of labour, um, and we can think of various... Uh, thinkers who kind of theorised what we call the revolt of the third estate. So Rousseau, Locke, Adam Smith, Hegel, Kant. Um, 
these uh, the what we call modern idealism, or German idealism, uh, but really beginning with Rousseau, who's uh, crucial in this respect. Um, so this change that we're talking <coughs> about here um, is not simply economic, right? It's not that people went from being peasants to workers, to, to selling their labour. Um, because even that kind of conception, right, is a bourgeois, a conception that we cast back on history from bourgeois society. So what sense does it make to say, oh, these people were hunter-gatherers? Did they, they didn't, that had nothing to do with their own self-conception. They weren't going around saying, oh, we're the ones who hunt and gather. Um, no, they were like the totemic species or whatever. And the same with peasants, right? They weren't like, oh, we're the peasants, we, you know, and this is like the caste system. They were like, society was Christendom, the first two estates were all that counted, and everyone else was basically nothing. Um, so the transformation that happens here is, um, is a kind of transformation of cosmos. So here we have like what we can call a religious cosmos. Right. All these categories that become articulated individually or come into themselves in bourgeois society, so we can say art, science, philosophy, um, religion, politics. Right. In traditional civilization, this is all just religion. Right. Art is religious. Art, politics is. Uh, we can essentially say part of this like religious cosmos um, philosophy right, it's theology um, so we have modern philosophy first time and these uh, these areas of knowledge become disarticulated and they come into themselves as such um, and da -da -da. And another category we could add on there is like is space and time, right? So there's uh, bourgeois space and time. We get like Newtonian physics, um, whereas in traditional civilization there wasn't like this. There wasn't universal time in the same way. Um, and what you get as well is history. There is no history in traditional civilization. There's no like uh, history in the way that we understand it in modernity. Um, and one of the texts that we read in the reading group early on, when we're when we're thinking about this this change, is Kant's idea for a cosmopolitan history from a universal standpoint. And that's something that could only be possible in bourgeois society. Um, the idea of a universal history from a cosmopolitan standpoint. Uh, sorry, I think I said that the wrong way around. Um, right. Um, so in this kind of transformation, obviously we're talking about both continuity and change, but what we want to emphasise is that there's a qualitative, substantive transformation. That actually, human beings are not the same. We're really talking about, like, creatures on a different order. Um, and this is kind of where we get Rousseau coming along and talking about his hypothetical state of nature. Right? He's, he's taking up the concept from other writers at the time who are coming before him, Holt and Locke uh, primarily, but he's critiquing this concept. Right? Critique uh, becomes a thing with Rousseau and he introduces it as a hypothetical in order to get relief uh, to get a view on his own society, to critically um, approach his, his own society. Um, and, right, so, uh, so understanding that change is um, something that Rousseau's taking up, um, and really thinking about um, this change of being and becoming that Marx was talking about. Um, Yeah. 
So, and another thing that comes out of Rousseau is that society is then a product of history, right? It's all been, it's all been leading to that point. Um, one of the things we can, we can mention now by, by pointing back to Jean Thomas is Thomas uh, calls this Rousseauian socialism as a kind of resentment against society. Um, so there's, um, you know, Rousseau is ambivalent about whether this was good or bad. Maybe we should never have left the state of nature. Maybe the agricultural revolution was the worst thing that ever happened. Um, and so we can say that what happened here is that there's like a crisis of humanity. Uh, I mean, it was like devastating. And, but really what we're talking about is how this looks from the standpoint of bourgeois society. That uh, actually there's a crisis of humanity here. And Rousseau is kind of taking that up. Um, and I'll, I'm going to read a passage from the, uh, what's sometimes listed as an appendix to uh, the Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, where Rousseau's um, in this appendix basically going through saying how terrible society is, how it seems to multiply all the evils and troubles of mankind, um, but that, what are you going to do about it in the end? There's this new problem, a task of freedom, uh, that emerges in society. Um, the way Hegel will put this, right, is that uh, in um, in uh, in Oriental society, right, they knew that one person was free, and in ancient society in Greece and Athens, they knew that some some people were free. But in modern society, we know at least implicitly that all people are free, and this is like um, a new problem. So history for Hegel is the history of freedom. So in the famous passage in the introduction to the philosophy of history, he's talking about you know this image of how looking at history could just seem like um, uh, the slaughter bench of history, right? Shipwrecks confusedly hurled, um, and that one would just retreat into oneself in this kind of romantic turning away from the problem. Um, but Hegel says history is the history of freedom. So Rousseau's way of putting that is uh, like this. So having listed the problems of society, what then is to be done? Must societies be totally abolished? Must mine and yours be annihilated? And must we return again to the forest to live among bears? This is a deduction in the manner of my adversaries, which I would as soon as anticipate as let them have the shame of drawing. O oh, you who have never heard the voice of heaven, who think man destined only to live this little life and die in peace, you who can resign, in the midst of your populous cities, your fatal acquisitions, your restless spirits, your corrupt hearts and endless desires, resume, since it depends entirely on yourselves, your ancient and primitive innocence. Retire to the woods, there to lose the sight and remembrance of the crimes of your contemporaries, and be not apprehensive of degrading your species, by renouncing its advances in order to renounce its vices. As for men like me, whose passions have destroyed their original simplicity, who can no longer subsist on plants or acorns, or live without laws and magistrates, those who were honoured in their first father with supernatural instructions, those who discover in the design of giving human actions at the start a morality, which they must otherwise have been so long in acquiring, the reason for a precept in itself indifferent and inexplicable on every other system, those, in short, who are persuaded that the divine being has called all mankind to be partakers in the happiness and perfection of celestial intelligences, all these will endeavour to merit the eternal prize they are to expect from the practice of those virtues, which they make themselves follow in learning to know them. Um, so I think it's um, uh, an, important, an important passage, partly because in what's interesting about the Tamas essay is that he attributes to Rousseau a kind of resentment against society, um, in which it seems like it might be better to have gone back to the forests to abolish mine and yours, um, and to cast off the kind of um, the problems of society. Uh, whereas what Rousseau is saying here is that we're tasked with freedom, 
we're tasked, a divine being has called upon us to become celestial intelligences, uh, called on all mankind, right? This kind of um, uh, bourgeois perspective on freedom and the task of freedom in history that, uh, that Rousseau is picking up. Um, it's also important to think about the phrasing he uses, um, things like um, uh, vir those virtues which they make themselves follow in learning to know them. That's a very like Kantian, uh, obviously Rousseau is very influential on Kant and Hegel. Um, uh, this idea of like giving a law to yourself, um, of uh, social recognition and reason. Um, I think that's uh, importantly coming up in Rousseau as a new concept in, in society. Um, so uh, one thing we associate often with this like, transformation is the bourgeois revolution. Um, so it's not just a kind of social transformation in all of these areas, but we also have the English Civil War, the Dutch Revolt, um, all the way through to the American Revolution and the French Revolution, um, in which basically um, society and the state politically tries to uh, realise what's been happening in society anyway. Um, and... Uh, it's this revolutionary tradition, right? There is only one revolution, it's the bourgeois revolution, uh, that Marx is picking up, that Marxism is picking up, that is in crisis in the 19th century, um, and that uh, Marx is really addressing. Um, and again, that issue of bourgeois revolution and what they mean and so on is something that's... Um, uh, very much confused um, on the left, and it's something that Thomas picks up. Um, so, th to talk about this in terms, as I did with regards to Rousseau, as like a, a crisis of humanity, is to say both that this bourgeois society seems to be the culmination of traditional civilization, right? It's in a, you get that sense sometimes in Hegel that this is the like, uh, the crowning point of uh, all, uh, all history leading up to this point, that it's the end of history. Um, but you also get the sense that, this sense of it being something new, a new beginning, that everything before this was prehistory, and that history begins now. Um, so there's a kind of uh, a dialectic between it being an end and a beginning. Um, and that's, again, something that, that Marx will take up, because the issue of whether this society points beyond itself uh, and what that would mean. So, um, what we get into in the uh, 19th century with the Industrial Revolution is basically the crisis of this world, the crisis of the society of those who labour, the crisis of the third estate, the crisis of the bourgeois revolutions, um, that, uh, and capital is... Marx's way of talking about this self-contradiction, that the Industrial Revolution manifests in mass unemployment for the first time, the, uh, the outstripping of the mode of production, the industrial mode of production, <coughs> of the forces of production, of, sorry, of the um, forces of production, of the uh, social relations of labour, that's the mode of production, um, and the contradiction between those two things that's resulting in mass unemployment, in the political crisis that's manifest in Chartism, um, and really ultimately for Marx is manifest in the uh, failure of the revolutions of 1848. So um, I think another important way of doing that would be to say, uh, to say 1789, 1848, <coughs> and then Maybe we can say 1917, question mark. Um, but that basically, the, what's recognised in 1848 is the crisis of the bourgeois revolutions. So Marx's phrase from the 18th Brumaire that the bourgeoisie are no longer able to rule and the proletariat are not yet ready. That a new state form emerges that rises up above both of these to manage the contradiction. Um, this is the like, Bonapartist state. 
right? That Napoleon III is the farce, whereas his uncle was the tragedy. Um, this is already apparent in England in the 1830s, right? So um, before the Germans had Bismarck, we had the Iron Duke of Wellington, who um, brought a thousand troops down to Parliament Square to uh, smash the Chartists on the 10th of April, although it was completely overblown and there was absolutely no need for it. Um, but this kind of militarization of the state, the um, beginning of welfare programs, of um, you know the outcomes of the new poor laws in the 1830s, um, this is really a crisis of bourgeois society. Um, so one of the points that we need to make going back is that what is the working class? Right? What is the proletariat? The proletariat is bourgeois. Right? It's those who labour. Um, Lukács says this very clearly uh, in uh, Reputation and the Standpoint of the Proletariat that um, you know, what, what really is the difference of the standpoint of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie? Right? Um, is it that there's like two pr separate principles in this E.P. Thompson way? No, it's just from a Marxist perspective that the proletariat are the self-contradiction of, of bourgeois society. They're bourgeois subjects who can't realise themselves. Um, that there's a crisis of this uh, production of man through social, the exchange of social relations of labour in society. Um, and I'll sort of move towards wrapping up, but um, in a way then, for Marx, we no longer live in bourgeois society. Right? We live in capital. And that capital is Marx's way of talking about this self-contradiction of bourgeois society. It's not a thing. Capitalism is not a thing. Socialism is not a thing. These are like symptoms of this crisis. Um, so that um, yeah, anti-capitalism would seem a very strange term to, uh, to Marx. Um, in a way, capital is this alienation of bourgeois society from itself. It's unable to reappropriate itself. Um, we can think about the problem of mass unemployment and how people approach it, for example, that from an Adam Smith perspective, say, in the 18th century, it would make absolutely no sense to have masses of people unemployed um, because you would employ them to produce value and wealth. Um, whereas that doesn't seem to be the case in the, by the 1830s anymore. Uh, you have mass unemployment, you start having welfare programmes, you start having workhouses, you start, if we follow Carlyle, having public pools of arsenic, right? Malthus comes along, there's all this crisis about overpopulation and so on. Um, so, um, whereas bourgeois society was, uh, had this dialectic of becoming, that's now in crisis in what Marx calls capitalism, right? This uh, reification of bourgeois society. Um, um, so that the worker is no longer this kind of self-made bourgeois subject, um, but rather proletarianized. And that's not... Um, to say just a condition of a few people, but Marx is saying this is the condition of the whole of society. The whole of society is becoming proletarianized. Um, and that this really manifests in 1848 where, where the, the, you know, the liberal bourgeoisie who are calling for order are shot down from their balconies in the name of order. That um, the, in the name of the republic, Louis Bonaparte establishes the empire again. Um, that on the barricades, people on both sides are calling for uh, the social republic. Uh, sorry, rather for the for the revolution. Right, they both think they're inheriting the revolutionary tradition of seventeen eighty nine. Um, so, in a way, um, what happens is is that. 
the workers' movement for socialism, right? Which is the we have to remember Marx is not like the best socialist or the best communist, uh, but rather he's the best critic of these movements which are emerging in the in the eighteen thirties and forties anyway. Um, in a way, the demands of the workers' movement for socialism are repeating the demands of the third estate, right? So the traditional um, kind of uh, the traditional outcries of the third estate that society is corrupt, that um, there's a matter of exploitation, that people are being exploited, that people are demanding the value of their labour. Um, these are like this is what the third estate in its revolt uh, calls for. And so in a way, the workers' movement as bourgeois, necessarily, is trying to continue the bourgeois revolution in that sense. Um, and so it's going to be self-contradictory, right? It's going to lead to... Um, it's not going to be able to realise those aims because it is itself, as Marx said, the dissolution of those aims, right? It's the... It's the dissolution of bourgeois society. Um, and uh, Marx's point of the proletariat abolishing itself um, or overcoming itself or moving to a society, moving um, beyond social relations of labour um, is the aim of... as the aim of Marxian socialism, as why then politically a dictatorship of the proletariat is necessary to um, to basically stop reproducing the third estate. That is that the discontents in capitalism reproduce capitalism. So people demand the value of their labour and that's how capital is reproduced. Um, so uh, Moshe Postone has this phrase um, uh, capital constituting revolutions. It seems that the Russian Revolution, for example, uh, which failed as a socialist revolution, which failed to be international, uh, simply uh, constituted capitalism in Russia. Right, This advanced industrialization, uh, this valorization of labor, um, that these were capital uh, constituting revolutions. Um, the issue is, how does uh, the workers' movement for socialism point beyond itself? How does it point to its own self-abolition? Uh, can it do so? That's where Marxism begins with the critique of Proudhon, with the critique of socialism, with the critique of political economy. Um, so I'll end by saying that, you know, going back to the GM Tamas, that... Um, that that really is the dialectic, right? The dialectic is the... The, the Marxist dialectic is that um, negative dialectic, as Adorno will call it later, that the proletariat is, um, is, uh, stands for its own self-abolition, that it both is the demands of the third estate and is not the demands of the third estate. Um, it's that dialectic that's taken up by the Second International and then by Lenin, Luxembourg and Trotsky. Um, and it's really that dialectic that has disappeared in the 20th century. So what we're left with is the left as various forms of what Tamas calls Rousseauian socialism, although I think perhaps, as I try to indicate, the term Rousseauian is not uh, perhaps apposite. Um, various forms of anti-capitalism, right? revolts of the third estate against various bourgeois discontents, we can say. Um, so um, that um, we need to abolish the market because we need to have, like, because it alienates us from each other and we need to, like, go back to just making things for use value or we need to um, uh, get rid of... Um, we need to get rid of the capitalists, and then we'll have this na right nationalisation. We'll have the state running everything. Um, these are just ways of reconstituting capital in a way. Um, and the uh, the kind of 
critique of the contemporary left that GM Thomas has is that they are reproducing the revolt of the third estate. Um, and what Platypus is re recovering in this, um, in this perhaps peculiar Marxist understanding of history is um, this understanding of bourgeois society uh, because that's the basis on which the uh, Marxist dialectic uh, can be understood. Otherwise, it becomes an issue of uh, exploitation. It does, it's not specific to social domination and capital. It's just exploitation. Uh, but of course, exploitation has happened for the whole of human history. Um, so uh, the, the point of the Rousseau, for example, is to say, well, yeah, exploitation has, has always happened. Um, the issue is what's new, what can change, and uh, what points beyond it. Unfortunately, the left today is just concerned with uh, exploitation in, uh, in that sense, and it's kind of anti-capitalism that uh, GM Thomas talks about. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Sorry if I went a bit over time. Um, and yeah, take questions. Yeah, thanks a lot already. Okay. <laughs> um. <clears throat> yeah, are there any questions? Um, just to clarify, when you talked about the Rousseauian socialism, that's what Thomas attributes to Thompson, right? Yeah. That, so that's the same. Huh? Th those two are the same things in your... Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, at the end of Thomas, he, he says, like, there's Rousseauian socialism and there's Marxist socialism, mm. or there's Marxism. And it's to do with this understanding of what class is, what the proletarian is. So he says Rousseauian socialism sees the working class as this, like, positive thing, right? It's uh, grounded in community... It um, has like positive work values. Um, it's not like corrupt and decadent. Um, it's not superfluous. Um, and that Marxism is about what James Hamas calls the demonic character of the working class. This, this negative character. Um, this self-contradiction of bourgeois society. Uh, it's a very good... I think he has a very good critique of E.P. Thompson and uh, Marxism in the 20th century based on this. Um, however, as I tried to point out, I think the term Rousseauian might be yeah. misleading. Um, <laughs> the main way in which it is misleading is that all of these things which appear under capitalism as raisonnement, as the idea that um, the working class has a good work ethic, but the capitalists are like lazy and uh, superfluous. But that's really a way of viewing the world that is the revolt of the further state, right? That the, those who work, we are society, and the priests and the kings are parasites that need to be thrown off, right? So it reproduces that movement like necessarily. The issue really, though, is that that's not the problem we're facing, right? It's not that there's a bunch of evil capitalists who go around doing nothing and are lazy or whatever, and we good workers are like, you know, we should run things. Um, but rather that society itself is in a self-contradiction. There's no parasite to class to, like, throw off, right? It's the, it's the self-abolition of the proletariat to overcome the principle of labour. Does that, does that not presuppose that we've had a bourgeois revolution and, and arguably there might be, we've talked about these developments in countries that haven't yet had the, 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 the bourgeois revolution and go straight into this Trotskyist permanent revolution kind of, mm. um, where you go directly from, from kind of a feudal, um, pre-bourgeois maybe, uh, into, into a socialist or into mm. a, a revolution? And, and isn't that also reproducing the cries of the third estate, I think you said at some point? Um, and if so, is that the right way to go? <laughs> uh -huh. So th this obviously becomes... I mean, this is an issue all the way from 1848 through to 1917 in particular, you know, this kind of critique of, well, Russia was just a peasant society, actually. Um, the bourgeois revolutions did happen, 
uh, despite what many postmodern academics will tell us, right? <laughs> this idea from Bruno Latour that we've never been modern, mm-hmm. this kind of obsession with medievalism and uh, that modernity is not a thing. Um, and it was universal, thanks mm. to the British. Right? <laughs> Marx calls uh, England the demiurge of the bourgeois cosmos. Um, so that you know that this is a cosmology, a religious cosmology. This is a this is a cosmology of like those who labour, social relations of labour. Um, and England is the demiurge, right? I we made we remade the whole world in this in this revolutionary way. Um, so that um, uh, that for all intents and purposes, like. Um, the task of um, freedom in history is universal from Kant onwards. Right? That Kant's idea for a universal history from a cosmopolitan standpoint, that's already the task. He's already saying we need a universe, we need a like global system of governance. Um, that freedom tasks the whole of humanity. Um, so from already from that point, there's no like outside. Um, okay. The issue of permanent revolution is um, complicated. Um, Trotsky is getting it from Marx, and it means um, it's to do with the crisis of eighteen forty-eight, right? So this idea that uh, the democratic revolution is not is seemingly leading to undemocratic forms. Um, it's not so much to do with like having a bourgeois revolution mm, okay. and then having a um, socialist revolution afterwards. Um, rather, it's to do with how the bourgeois revolution is self-contradictory. Because the socialist revolution is going to be a bourgeois revolution. Right? It's going to be uh, like carrying on, there is only one revolution. Um, the issue of like socialism is the is this like dialectical self-critique of the bourgeois revolution um, that will kind of be cognizant of its own self-contradiction. Um, okay, so it's about realising that the, the socialist revolution just is the the self-awareness of the contradiction in the same bourgeois revolution. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, and to, to, to come back to another term I mentioned earlier, that's why that's the role. That's what theory is. What like what's theory? Why do we need it? Um, why does G. M. Thomas say E. P. Thompson has no theory? Or why do Marxists say uh, anarchists have no theory? What does that mean? Right. Um, it means that they don't take up this issue of their own self-contradiction, right? Um, Marxism is basically anarchism, right? But it's trying to achieve the same thing in a certain way. Um, the issue is about why that's not happening and how it can happen. Uh, so there's so Marxism is the self-critique of socialism or the self-critique of anarchism. Right, um, and that's the issue of theory. Now, why does Thomas say E. P. Thompson has no theory? Because if you think the working class is a positive principle that's out to realise itself, you don't need theory. You don't. You don't need Marxism. You don't need uh, self-criticism. You just go and do it. Um, and so that's an important distinction to make. I don't understand what, like, what is this contradiction you keep on talking about within mm-hmm. uh, the revolution? Like, is it, you know, is it just because it's like happening within what you call bourgeois society? Or, uh, and yeah, I don't, I don't really understand that. Okay, maybe, maybe I didn't make. Um, is it because you know, like, it's, it's like, it's the society that's you know supposed to come after is beyond the horizon of expectation or you know whatever you might call it. it it's because of the industrial revolution um, so that 
in bourgeois society, you pursue freedom, both individually, socially, um, uh, through uh, labour, right? You become yourself through your work. You um, are able to, you don't have a fixed role in life. You're not just a peasant. You can uh, sell your labour freely, freely contract, right? You are a bourgeois subject when you go and sell your labour to someone. Um, the issue in the Industrial Revolution is the increasing um, uh, overcoming of labour as a way of mediating uh, social relations. So there's a crisis of labour as the way of mediating the production of wealth and value in society. Mm, that, no, 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 mediating, hang on, <laughs> that doesn't make it much clearer. Um, so or, or like, uh, let's say, reappropriating. We can think about it in terms of um, uh, metabolism, mm -hmm. society's metabolism, um, that the, the overproduct, right, the idea of overproduction, of surplus, this is like a problem for a metabolism, right, that you're not actually processing things properly, so you're having these uh, surpluses, you have surplus labour, that's bonkers from the standpoint of bourgeois society the idea of surplus labour. Um, mass unemployment really is the contradiction. Um, and so the issue is that what, that's, what that problem is pointing to is um, the overcoming of labour as a social principle. But because we are bourgeois subjects, we naturally are like reproducing labour. What, what do you mean by social principle? Um, meaning that this bourgeois society, that it's the society of those who labour, that's, that's the basis on which we form all our categories and our ways of understanding the world and our relationships to each other. So our um, relationship to nature, to ourselves mm -hmm. and to other human beings is uh, mediated in that way. Mm -hmm. Does that... Well, what do you mean by bourgeois society? Like, I, st I still don't understand, like, it, because the way you uh, talk about it now, it makes it seem like this kind of intellectual formation, or whatever you might call it. This one? An intellectual formation, uh, you know, just a group of ideas about society that mm -hmm. some people had, and then kind of applied it in a revolutionary manner, or whatever, mm -hmm. um, which I think is, like, that's obviously like, very idealistic, so I'm just wondering, what is the... Uh, material basis of this so-called bourgeois society, mm -hmm. and do you make a distinction between bourgeoisie, like bourgeoisie and capitalists? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. That's because you yeah. make a distinction between bourgeois society and capital or capitalism. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would so um, bourgeois society is uh, a form of social practice, right? It's not just a, a set of ideas. This is one of the important uh, transformations in philosophy, right? With uh, from Rousseau to Kant and Hegel, that philosophy becomes about social practice, right? Um, so that categories in Kant are categories of social practice. Um, and so uh, philosophy becomes worldly. This idea from us that philosophy became worldly with Hegel and we have to make the world philosophical. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not just a set of ideas. Right? That the idea is that these ideas are a reflection on social practice. So Rousseau is coming along and saying, look guys, we are living in society, and society is not just like a bunch of individuals <coughs> adding up, but it's more than the sum of its parts. Right? There's a general will, and that this is like, um, there's a dialectic of theory and practice of subject and object, there's, that our social practices are producing our consciousness. Right, that basic get, like the idea that we get in Hegel and Kant and so. Um, so, um, so bourgeois society is social practice and not just ideas. Um, bourgeoisie um, and capitalists. Um, these, I would say, the important thing to stress is this idea of bourgeois subjectivity, that everyone in this society is bourgeois, in that sense. 
um, the idea of having like capitalists is a symptom of a problem because from the standpoint of bourgeois society we're all just freely contracting agents we're all producers right and some people produce by like owning the machines some people produce by selling their labor and you know why isn't this just why, why isn't it just a society of uh, freely contracting agents right that's the aim of bourgeois society um, okay another way of addressing this is to say bourgeois society is the first classless society this is like a, one of the ways Marx deals with the contradiction right so this um, this is caste right there's no classes here there's just castes and then in bourgeois society the idea that the third estate is everything and the first and second estates we're just going to cast them off they're nothing they can become workers People, if you want, if you want to have a priest, he'll be a worker, and you'll pay him to preach, right? Um, and instead of like kings, we'll have politicians, right? Um, that's the first classless society, right? The aim of bourgeois society is the classless society. At the same time, it's the first class society, right? If that then produces an industrial revolution, its own contradiction. So. No, if, uh, but yeah. I think what, what's going on here is that it's, um, I get that it's about social practice, but mm -hmm. it seems like we're also at some point along the way, um, by a sleight of hand, bringing in some materialist condition about how to distinguish the two classes, right? So on the one hand, we can say that bourgeois society is the first class of society because of this free, free contracting individuals and everyone is a bourgeois subject. But yeah. then... When you make the move to say, and that's how classes develop, then it seems like you're bringing in material, right? Well, okay. Or how so do we move from this horizontal right. to this hierarchical right. class society? Well, we, we move there in the Industrial Revolution, but not objectively, right? Class isn't, in Marxism at least, it's not a sociological category. It's not an objective thing. Um, so what happens is classes form politically, they become politically opposed to each other. So what's happening in England, say, in the 1830s? The liberal bourgeoisie are struggling to put through the Reform Act. Right? They want to extend the franchise to the middle class. They want to abolish the Corn Laws, uh, which came in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and they seem to be doing it against the Tories, who seem to be the remnants of the uh, aristocracy, politically. And it seems at the time that basically all the workers and all the middle class are in just one political group. They all want the same, they should all want the same thing, right? So the radicals, the liberal radicals in England, are uh, trying to get the workers to go on strike to support the Reform Act to get the middle class people to vote. And it seems that their political interests are aligned. So what does it seem is happening here? It seems like we're still continuing the bourgeois revolution. That there's those who work and produce the third estate, and there's this aristocracy that's basically hasn't fully got out of the way yet, and we just need to clear off the last little bit um, and complete the bourgeois revolution. And that in that situation, there isn't a, a class conflict between the workers and the bourgeoisie. They're on the same side. They're, they're, liberals trying to establish a uh, modern society. Um, what's happening in the 1830s because of the Industrial Revolution is mass unemployment, the new poor laws which uh, throw people into workhouses, which massively um, shift populations, people become proletarianized, and they start to um, realize that they're not able to achieve their aims politically alongside the liberal bourgeoisie but, and but, they start to organize but when you say they become proletarianized that seems to be a material condition right so it, it's because of the poverty and because of the unemployment that we're talking about um i would say it's because of the unemployment um it's because of the um way in which one becomes totally dependent on wage labor in a way that wasn't the same before, and that then that wage labour becomes uh, superfluous, so that one's whole way of producing oneself becomes superfluous. And that's why you become a proletarian, or what? Hmm? 
That's the proletarianization. The, the issue of okay. yeah, the, the issue of class is a political one, right? It's subjective. It's people it's who organize okay. politically. When basically when the workers start organizing politically against the liberal bourgeoisie. But isn't that just isn't that very idealistic? Like saying that oh it's when people gain consciousness of their own class position that class arises. Mm -hmm. I mean I thought I thought it was like pretty like, I always thought at least that like a proletarian is just someone who has to sell their labor power in order to survive. And but it that's doesn't just matter. And then you might, what? That's just bourgeois. That's just bourgeois society. Those who labor. Yeah. To survive and to produce themselves. Okay. Mm. Yeah, okay. But yeah, okay. But I still don't understand uh, this you said like bourgeois society. Mm -hmm. It's the um what philosophy? Of, no, not philosophy of practice, but it's the. It's a social practice. It's a. It's a social. It's a system of social practice, right? Yeah. So, yeah. but that's just that everybody labors. Um. um yeah, that you know this this um, phrase from the Abbe says that the third estate will be everything. Mm. That w that is society, right? That is the yeah. nation, the people, these like categories that come up at that time. Um, and that, the, that, that those who don't are superfluous to society and need to be cast off. Okay. Hmm. Um, so it it um, it does actually it actually does sound idealistic to people now. I think in the in the, after the twentieth century, because we've become used to class as a objective sociological yep. principle. For Marx, it really is. I mean, this is why Lou Capture is important mm. in emphasizing that um, class is politically constituted. Such that now, after the failure of Marxism, right, after the death of socialism, um, mm -hmm. do we even have class, do we live in class society? What does it mean mm. now to say the working class if it was a, if the issue for Marx was a, that he was encountering a, self-organized working class that he critiqued. Uh, so that so for example, in the famously in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels say history is the history of class struggle. Mm. Right? As we've said before, that they have that's a kind of Hegelian uh, present oriented sense of history. That from the present, from the 1840s, it looks like the whole of history was the history of class struggle. Precisely because now we're going to overcome it through the revolution. Because there's a chance of changing it, a chance of overcoming it. Um, to Adorno and Horkheimer in the mid-20th century, after the failure of Marxism, they say that, well, from the standpoint of the present, it looks like history is the history of rackets, of gangsters. That basically, there never really was a like, class struggle to overcome itself. There were just various rackets in society um, that we've always then seems we've always lived in the authoritarian state. Um, we've always lived in Bonapartism in this sense. That history kind of after the in the absence of a class struggle for socialism, history like just melts into this um, endless like gangs and rackets things. Um, and, th and that's in a way how um, organized, the organized working class did seem at first. Why, would, why is trade unionism illiberal? It is actually illiberal. Because you're basically organizing a, a racket, a monopoly, against other workers and against the consumer. right? And... That's something that seems to become necessary with mass unemployment in the Industrial Revolution. So what you have in England in the 1820s and 30s, this thing called the Glasgow Thugs in, in Scotland. The Glasgow Thugs were, a, this is before uh, unions were allowed, they were a secret organ, organised union who would kill people who broke the picket line. And they would pay their members to go out and kill people. Uh, they paid their members at one point to burn down a factory full of women and children who were brought in as scabs 
to break the strike of the men. And uh, one time they paid for someone to be murdered. They then paid for the murderers to be moved to America and set up with a new life there. Poor workers were putting their money forward into a, into a secret union to do it. And, uh, it, you know, from one standpoint, it's like, well, yeah, organized labor is just a gang. <laughs> right? Um, Rosa Luxemburg says in, um, is it in the mass strike? I can't remember where, but that, um, what are trade unions? They're, um, they're a racket against the consumer. Uh, yeah. um, can I ask something maybe slightly different? Because um, I think you talked about this kind of flawed anti-capitalism according to which the task of socialism is just to overcome uh, exploitation and oppression, right? And uh, I think well, like what gives rise to this idea is often um, the idea that the proletariat is just the most um, um, uh, suppressed uh, class out there. So. Yeah. That's why they're like most likely to just come up with the right kinds of ideas, and that's why, um, as a socialist, one should rely on that class. And uh, I'm always not so sure, like, um, why that is not the case in Marxism. Like, maybe you, can you elaborate, like, uh, uh, why this is like a flawed understanding of Marxism? Mm -hmm. Well, um, there are a couple of different ways of approaching that. Um, one is to say that. In, in the kind of line I was pushing from the GM Tamas article, Telling the Truth About Class, that the proletariat has no, has nothing to realise. It has no values to realise. Um, it's not that they're the kind of, um, the good people who are being oppressed, um, but rather that they need to seek, they seek their own self-abolition. Um, Another way of approaching it is to say that the problem of exploitation is not historically specific, right? So it seems to be, I mean, this goes to the way in which, like, after the death of Marxism, history seems like this history of rackets. It just seems like exploitation, right? Um, whereas Marx thinks that capital is a problem of social domination. This phrase, social domination. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Why is that different? It means that the whole of society is dominated by capital. That the whole of the, the capitalists, so-called, are subject to this self-contradiction as well. Um, and that they also confront an alienated society that seems to be run on a set of laws that's beyond their control. And they can also just be thrown into the pile of the proletariat, right? In, in traditional civilization, if you're a king, you can't become a peasant. You can't be like, oh, sorry, you did a bad job as a king, and now go and be a peasant. Um, uh, what happens, what can happen in capitalism, however, is you can go bankrupt. You can become proletarianized. Um, and uh, so that really gets to this issue of why it's a self-contradiction of society. Um, that the issue is affecting the whole of society that needs a total transformation, um, that that's not an issue of exploitation, which would be, well, if you're exploiting me, I'll just make you stop. The issue really is that I'm exploiting myself. Right? That I, the proletariat who goes and sells their labour, is exploiting themselves. Um, and, um, you know, the, an interesting case is the um, Luddites, right? So in the, in the beginning of this problem, in the 1810s and 20s in England, you have people who go and smash up machines. And workers in Nottingham were going and smashing up lace weaving frames, right? And there were big riots in Nottingham. And the punishment at the time this is in 1812, was um, 14 years transportation for smashing frames to go on one of these big uh, prison ships. And they, uh, the politicians wanted to make the punishment death. Because this is outrageous, right? In, from the standpoint of bourgeois society, going and like, you're a freely contracting agent, and you go and smash up someone's means of living, their, their machines, like, um, 
you know, you're destroying bourgeois society. And that's why Marx can say that they like the working class is expressing the destruction of bourgeois society in its existence. But um, so they're debating what to do, and um, one of the politicians says, you know, um, well, we don't want to make the death penalty death because what if there is just like a bad master? What if like Philip is employing me and he's actually just really horrible to me and in a fit of anger I lash out and break the machine? That's like, I shouldn't be put to death for that, they don't think. That's exploit tech, right? He's just being mean to me. And like the, you know, there should be a better contractual relationship. Um, or is this like a deeper problem? Uh, or is it like something else that's, um, that's the, a way of like putting the problem. So at the same time that when they're having these debates in parliament, they're talking about, well, um, should we, should we treat these workers like we treated, um, this thing in Ireland that was called the white boys? Um, it's not what it sounds like now. But the white boys were uh, peasants in Ireland who ripped up um, fences that were being put into demarcate fields for agricultural capitalists. Um, and th uh, the British army went over and shot them. Right. Um, and they're like, well, are these like, is this the Irishism, as Engels would say, of the working class? Should we just shoot them? Um, or is there like, deeper problem because uh, one MP stands up and he says like well it's strange really because the workers in Birmingham are like known for being thrifty slow methodical thoughtful right he's basically saying these are like good protestant bourgeois subjects they're not like crazy savages right um, and so we should think a bit harder about why it is that they're going and smashing up the machines like this um of course, at the time, their, their solutions are things like um, uh, uh, abolishing the corn laws, right? They think the corn laws are keeping the price of bread high. And so, well, then the workers will... Or they think that um, the Napoleonic Wars are taxing the society too much. Or they think that because of overpopulation, we need to uh, send people to go and live in America. Um, you know, those are the kind of solutions that they have. They still think, like, basically, they're like, well, we, this is still bourgeois society. Um, we just need to, like, expand it a bit more. Uh, we're just not doing it very well. War is against the principles of bourgeois society, of course. From a liberal standpoint, like, why have the Napoleonic Wars? It's an absolute waste of wealth and production. Um, and, you know, and that's why the workers are getting upset. <coughs> But that seems like there is, maybe to play devil's advocate, but then the, having gotten to this stage where maybe what we've got now is some middle way between extreme um, destitution on, the, on part of the working class and now we have maybe some welfare states and some reformism and trade unionism and all this stuff that the revisionists were maybe talking about, then... Where is the clear contradiction in today's society? <laughs> um, and in the case that there isn't one, what does that mean for capitalist society and the self-contradiction? Do, do you know what I mean? Um, because one could say, or Bernstein <laughs> could say now, well, this is the society I was imagining. This is great. <laughs> There's nothing, right? In, I mean, um, in a weird way, like, we, we live... I think, I think this is an Adorno phrase, but... Um, we live in like the farce of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Like the the issue of Bonapartism, the welfare state, the idea that because society is not living up to its bourgeois ideals, it's not self-regulating. Right. So in, in in the bourgeois revolutions, we want a minimal state so that society can just regulate itself. This kind of you know the the goal of anarchism. Um, which is like a bourgeois liberal goal. Um, the idea that that's not working and so the state comes in and starts managing the contradictions. Um, in a way, it does seem like a kind of uh, 
weird um, inverted version of um, how like uh, socialism would begin to reorganize society. You know, the government like if if the government needs like more people to be employed somewhere, they drag a bunch of capitalists in front of parliament and they say, you know, you have to do this contract better, or we'll only give you the contract if you do this. It's like totally illiberal. Um, <coughs> but to go back to the beginning of your point, um, it it does seem, as I was saying before, that um, maybe we no longer live in class society because class is not being politically organized towards the goal of socialism. Mm, no, because class was earlier was an expression of the contradiction of the bourgeois society and saying that we now not live... So this is a point about the political awareness of the class itself, right? But, yeah. but that's almost like saying that bourgeois society nowadays doesn't have a self-contradiction. And surely that's not something that we'd be willing to say. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying no, that's but... how it seems. Right. Mm, okay. I'm saying that the... Okay, this a term that I've like sh shamefully neglected regression, right? That um, this that the regression in consciousness of freedom, right, uh, has actually obscured the problem that still tasks us. We're still tasked. We are. We do still live in this society, right? We still live in uh, the self-contradiction of bourgeois society and capitalism. Um, but uh, a regression in consciousness of the task of freedom, like following the death of the failure of the social of the revolution, the attempt to change the world miscarried, um, it does actually affect our like, consciousness of it, su such that it seems, right, when Adorno and Horkheimer say history is the history of rackets, they're not saying it is, they're saying it seems yes. from the stem, from the from the regression of the present. Um, uh, so it seems we've regressed back to not being consciously aware of the contradiction again. Mm -hmm. So to a like pre-theoretical state when yeah. we have to achieve theory again or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we have to achieve, yeah, the recognition of the self-contradiction, the dialectic. Um, that... Um, uh, that in that sense like Bernstein has been proved right like we live in that world now but because this consciousness of the problem has disintegrated and that that was already apparent in you know like um, the emergence of revisionism in the SPD in Germany um is a symptom of regression, right? That uh, Bonapartism is regression, right? That from 1848, history hasn't progressed. This Hegelian idea, from in terms of this timeline, from the standpoint of bourgeois society, that history is the history of freedom, that we now know that all people are free, and that society as the general will, more than the sum of its parts, this like Rousseauian task of freedom in society, um, that uh, it's the consciousness of that that has regressed since 1848. Um, the idea of the state managing society is like uh, kind of counter to those, to those aims. Um, So I, I just have to, I still, I'm still a bit confused on what point, so for, in your uh, um, narrative, whatever, mm -hmm. it's like, is class something that like objectively exists? Because you just said that when you asked if we live in a classless society or there's no contradiction in bourgeois society right now, you said no, it's just that we're not like aware of it. Mm -hmm. But before that you said class is a political, mm -hmm. a question of political organization. Mm -hmm which seems to require some kind of Awareness. consciousness yeah. mm -hmm. and that's what constitutes class mm -hmm. as such. But that's so what, like, is it well, the class and the contradiction are not the same? Okay, so... Right. Well... Um, but what is the contradiction then? 
Or who are the contradictions between? No, I think I think that's right. That that is the contradiction, right? That we um, we live in a proletarian society. So the contradiction right? is that class exists. Uh, right. On the one hand, it exists, and on the other hand, it's been liquidated by the uh, failure of Marxism. That both things seem to be true. Okay, so you're kind of talking about an ideal existence form of class and like an objective existence form of class, or what? And those um, two are in opposition. Or? Well, I mean, this is this is a problem. For example, that um, Lukács picks up on right. This is class subjective or objective. Um, and the problem is that if in bourgeois society we have a dialectic of subject and object, right, that one is like producing the other, mm -hmm. um, then the issue is that uh, in the absence of a subjective factor in history, right, in the absence of the, uh, or in the absence of um, a, a working class movement for socialism, the object starts to disintegrate. Right, you can't like grasp the object um, without the subject. Mm. Um, so, um, and it, and it's precisely in that in that moment to to go back to Philip's question. It's precisely in that moment that people try and resolve that contradiction that you're like hitting on that both of these things at the same time, by saying, as E.P. Thompson does, well, the working class is this thing and we're for it. That resolves the contradiction neatly, right? Too neatly. It says, um, okay, forget about that, like theory, dialectic stuff, but um, we're on the side of the oppressed. Uh, you know, this kind of like Stalinist, which side are you on? Hmm. Are you with the workers? Or are you against them? Are you a class traitor? Right. <laughs> um, that um, that's a that's a symptom of people basically uh, falling below the the recognition of Marxism in order to uh, come to terms with like the contradiction that you're pointing out. Mm -hmm. That it's that it's too difficult to basically. Um, deal with so we, we retreat Tamas calls it a retreat uh, it's a retreat from Marxism to a more comfortable um, uh, an ethic or something but can, um, I, can I ask why don't we just like maybe I'm retreating a bit in, like, <laughs> why can't we just say that like class exists objectively and the consciousness is just not, not there instead of saying that you have like you, you use class for both of these terms I think that's very confusing because um or is it because the class actually exists as a consciousness in, in history? Uh, because because um, there's an issue of subject and object, right? That if from a kind of Hegelian perspective, one has this understanding of, uh, you know, the, the dialectical relationship between subject and object, mm -hmm. uh, and that that is breaking down in capitalism, then... Um, one can't just say class is objective. Mm. Um, so, for example, people like Adorno will treat uh, the rise of sociology as a symptom um, of this regression. Mm. The attempt to um, objectively grasp the problems of the industrialized masses, right, mm. um, is... Uh, a, a symptom of regression in capitalism. So that's why Adorno like will treat sociology as an object of critique because he thinks he can say um, he can show how it expresses like the contradiction somehow. But let me ask you then: Could you what? How? What would you say then uh, uh, to um, to the transition from a feudal society to a capitalist society? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, the existence form of labor changes from being serf based, uh, you know, there's a manorial center and you know, there's serfs and there's uh, overlord and so on and so forth, into the um, existence of a 
labor market, a free labor market. Mm -hmm. um, so how would you, how would you describe that? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that? I think that's obviously an economic transformation going on, but that doesn't entail necessarily like a transformation in consciousness or like the, you know, going. For, yeah, I don't know. Okay, now you say that there's no classes before capitalism, but the existence form of labor obviously changes. Mm -hmm. What would you then say is, is going on there? Is that a transformation in class structure? Or what 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 do you think? Um, it is perhaps um, uh, somewhat mysterious, not quite as mysterious as the uh, the Neolithic revolution, like how that happened, how people went from being hunter gatherers to having like organized agriculture. Um, what made that necessary uh, is is very obscure. Um, this transformation is also obscure. Um, how, um, why feudal society began to break down, why the, the Italian city-states emerged as a like uh, a class of merchants, um, why, for example, what was you know the role of the Protestant Reformation, um, why was that kind of like consciousness emerging, um, how was um, you know, the, in the English Civil War, mm. the idea that there were masterless men who cut off the king's head and declared the republic, you know, these kinds of things. Um, uh, I think the important point is that it is a total transformation of consciousness, of human consciousness, because of its relationship to social practice. So that social practices change and that that is... Uh, changing consciousness as well. But it's still not class. Well, the <coughs> it's an issue of what we mean by class, right? Yes. So it seems, from the standpoint of the revolt of the third estate, the French Revolution, all this stuff, that they're not a class. They're, a, they're an estate, right? And that actually they're not really an estate. They are society, this, mm -hmm. these new terms that come up. They are everything. And so one has to think about their own self-consciousness. What was their own understanding of what they were doing? They were making everyone free. Right, that's Hegel, right? Um, class, the, the, even the idea of class is a sign of a crisis of that like form of society. Yeah, and that's the contradiction that we were talking about and earlier, that's the that, that you have that you have free individuals on the same level, but then you also have difference in, in conditions, or you have... Well, it's not just difference in conditions, but it's the, um, the way that, again, to use the like, metabolic metaphor, the way that society is regulating itself breaks down. Uh, it can no longer regulate itself. The state has to start employing people. Um, uh, to go back to Carlyle's like half joking example, the state has to start providing public pools of arsenic in which people can throw themselves. Um, this is like a crisis of all the categories of bourgeois society. All of these cate all of these categories of like. Um, uh, uh, you know, all the categories of bourgeois society basically like come into crisis. So, um, art, right? We get like modernism, or like a kind of crisis of representation in from the middle of the nineteenth century onwards. Um, in uh, let's say history, right? This this term like Nietzsche's critique of historicism in the 1870s, right, historicism, that it's like this sickness of history, that there's an over, there's like a surplus of history, that it seems to become this endless thing. Um, so Nietzsche's like critique was critical history. Um, uh, and, yeah, so it seems to be like a reversal of 
um, of all the uh, the self understanding of all just as well. Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. But, uh, what what was the question? No, no, that was no, that that's fair. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, you also get like nationalism emerges as a new thing, right? In that after eighteen forty eight, you get or like you get this attempt to resolve the contradiction um, through a new form of nationalism. So the best example of this is uh, Benjamin Disraeli in the UK, who um, uh, is a Bonapartist, we can say, from a Marxist perspective. He's like developing the Bonapartist state in the UK. And Disraeli's... Um, Israeli is uh, accredited with this concept of one nation conservatism. He never really used that term. What he did do was write a novel called Sybil or the Two Nations, in which he was basically like, look, England's like going to hell because we're divided into two nations, right? The nation as the category of bourgeois emancipation of society is breaking down. I know what we need to do. We need to have some like good um, medieval values back and we need to have paternalistic values and we need to look after the poor and we need to have a welfare state and we need to have a strong military and we'll put it back together again. And so there's the Young England movement in the 1830s that kind of um, romanticizes medieval England as a way of unifying the nation again after it seems to have been uh, disintegrated. And why is it disintegrated? Mass unemployment, chartism, right? Um, so you get weird stuff. You get like Tories who write for chartist newspapers. Um, uh, religion becomes like, so it's another funny thing Carlyle picks up on, how religion then becomes like a way of dealing with the unemployed. People are like, oh well these, we've got these like, this mass of unemployed people and they're all, it's, it's like causing the disintegration of society and property is becoming like, property is disintegrating, you know, um, and you know, all of these things. Um, I know what we need to do. We need to give the people religion. They're not really getting religion properly. And so Carlyle jokes, well, you know, you've got millions and millions of people now in the UK. How you can't possibly have enough pastors and preachers to go around and teach them all religion. I know there are some really good machine builders in Birmingham. They're really getting this iron steam machine thing down. We'll have iron preachers that will that there'll be robots, he talks about this, robots that will preach 24-7 and we'll put them on the street corners in Birmingham and they'll, they'll be called uh, metal pastors and uh, it will be the Birmingham Iron Church. <laughs> and, you know, he like, it's, it's great fun to read, but it's a, he's already like very acutely picking up on, on the crisis of ideology. Um, and it being an issue of industrialization as the self-contradiction of bourgeois society. Um, yeah, the Birmingham Iron Church. Uh, I'm sorry, can I maybe ask something that's like um, related to a slightly different topic? I don't want to interrupt like no, this like strain of thought. But um, I know that you've been like painting this um, uh, this chart in the beginning, right? Like mm -hmm. with like being and becoming, and I must admit that I still struggle to understand like what this is actually about. Um, I understand like that there are like several se several concepts that have something to do with each other, but yeah. um, like w under what heading do these like different uh, uh, yeah these different concepts stand? Is this like on the one hand like this traditional mode of thinking or whatever? On the other hand, like this mode of thinking that is um, sort of linked to a bourgeois society. Or, um, yeah. or can you maybe like elaborate on that? Yeah. So obviously, um, there's dialectic between the two. Yeah. Obviously, there is a form of becoming in ancient society. Yeah. Um, and obviously, there is a form of being in modern society. The point is that the relationship has changed. Um, 
I mean, one of the ways that we think about it is with the epigraphs that we have to the Platypus reading group, and one in particular that's very good is Louis, Louis Menon's introduction to Edmund Wilson's To the Finland Station, where he talks about how in pre-modern society the ends of life are given at the beginning of life. Whereas in modern society, the ends of life are not given at the beginning of life. And that's why in modern society, death is the great taboo. Because you can't um, look back on your life knowing that you achieved what you were supposed to. Because you know that the values of society are mutable. They will change. And it's only like it will change in the future whether you lived a good life or not, based on changing values. Whereas in pre-modern society, that doesn't change you know you lived a good life, you were like a good peasant, or you like did your, you performed your role in society. Um, so that's like the being, what is nature. It, you know, Marx talks about this in the, in the passage that I read, the closed form of the, the childlike world of the ancients, where we seek for closed form and limitation, seems greatly exalted now in the like crisis of humanity in modern society, that we, we're like, Oh, if only I could be told what to do. This kind of authoritarianism mm. of under capitalism, of subjectivity. Um, that, but then Marx is like, well, um, you know, this is actually freedom. The establishment, the, the development of human capabilities beyond any previously established yardstick. Um, it was also that passage that I read from Rousseau, which I really like. Um, you know, those people who look at the history of society, because society is historical, and they just see death and destruction. You know, um, Europe's just been through, like, the religious wars. Um, and, uh, you know, not so long ago. And um, they basically, they want to go back to the woods and live with the bears. They want to um, abolish the separation of what's mine and what's yours. Right, this kind of resentment, as Nietzsche will later call it, um, and Rousseau is like, well, actually, um, I can't. My my passions have ch changed themselves. This like dialectical formulation. My own passions have changed themselves. I, mean, I think that's a good way of talking about like um, the transformation from traditional society to modern society. Um, is it, you know, um, uh, the, we, the question came up before about um, is it like social practice or is it like ideas? But Rousseau puts it, my passions have transformed themselves. I can't go back. A celestial, in, I've been called by the divine being to become a celestial intelligence, to like perfect myself, to pursue freedom. The whole of mankind is tasked with this. Um, these kinds of like, categories. I don't know if that answers your question about like being and becoming, but... Um. No, I think my question was fairly simple, but I think like, it uh, was just like, okay, well, like, like what are the poles that we're talking about? But I think it's just like modern and pre-modern society right. then, right? Yeah. But I mean, it's like helpful elaboration, like, nevertheless. Yeah. Mm. And the idea that, you know, you, you're lab like selling labor is kind of like a blank slate, that it could be put to en many and any purpose and even purposes that we haven't even thought of yet. That we've developed new needs and that they're real, right? There isn't like a set limitation on human needs. <coughs> this is another kind of form of the like horizontal against capitalism in modern society, right? That they think that, well, humans really only have a certain set of needs and that everything else is like decadence, right? Um, no, like human, the point with Rousseau is that human beings make new needs for themselves. Their passions transform themselves. Um, and these are like real things. We, like, we make new tasks for ourselves, new problems. Mm. And that's becoming. Um, it's now already like quarter past uh, okay. five. Um, I don't know, like since we started a bit later, maybe maybe I don't know. Is there like last question or something yeah, like yeah. that? Is there any last question? <laughs> I mean, we, we don't need to force it. Like if not, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, maybe I'll end by saying. 
um, uh, something about platypus. Um, so the issue um, of how this disintegrates in the 20th century, how this view of history disappears, which we've like tried to which I tried to talk about with reference to this GM Tamas essay, um, and thinking about how um, class becomes like an objective identity or a positive principle or um, people seek for, you know, um, other kinds of reactionary anti-capitalism, right, where they're saying um, uh, capitalism is this, like, decadent Western society. Um, we're on the side of, like, third world revolt because they're really, like, in touch with the earth and, like, um, their community, right? You get this you get this antinomy of individualism and communitarianism and the left is supposed to be for the community and the social principle and the right is like individualistic these kinds of like these really are like disintegrations of cap that would seem crazy from to Marx right um, and um, the ways in, I mean what one of the interesting things about Thomas essay is that he really links this uh, regression to treating class as a positive principle to statism to both um, Stalinist state management of society and to kind of Western welfare state and bureaucratic and you know even neoliberalism is a form of state capitalism I mean the state just got even bigger um, it didn't go away um, the um, that what happened that the actual like the position of treating it as a problem of exploitation of um, of the oppression of like the good working class in this way is that you think the problem can be uh, remedied by um, you know punishing capitalists you know uh, put the bankers in jail for uh, the financial crash this kind of thing um, that what you're asking is the state to intervene to basically help you out. Where of course the, the, the proposition of the Second International was to smash the state, to form the international dictatorship of the proletariat, to overcome labor as social value that the state would literally. Um, so uh, Platypus is really investigating the death of the left, this, this idea of regression. Um, and in order to do so, we recover this uh, perhaps peculiar Marxist dialectic of history um, as the um, uh, standpoint from which to, to recognize regression in the present. Um, and yeah, to that end, we run reading groups, coffee breaks, panel discussions. Um, we've Philip's been running it here in Oxford this year, and uh, we hope to, you know, keep it going and um, and run a, an educational project uh, in that sense. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Then, like, watch out for new events. Maybe next year we'll see like what, what is going on then. And uh, yeah. yeah. Apart from that. Uh, Wish you like a nice uh, term break. Yep. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming. Sorry if I.